Hi everyone and welcome back to Rachel's studio and in today's tutorial we're going to take a look at this guy. This is a chipmunk I painted on hot press and and thank you so much to Skylar Ewing on pexels.com for this beautiful reference of this chipmunk. And I have painted this chipmunk twice and if you all follow me over on my community page I put it up for a vote. Which one did you like better? The painting I did on cold press paper or hot press paper and at the time you all voted for the cold press and so I went back to the painting table and I added more background to this guy and some more depth and dimension and today I'm going to show you the full process with explanation of how I painted this chipmunk on hot press paper. We're going to explore a lot of fun new little techniques that I have not shown on this channel yet and some that are new to me including using a gel pen to create texture and also using stencils. If you would like to watch more tutorials such as this one in real time with downloadable line drawings and reference photos, join my Patreon where I so appreciate that support because it really does make this channel possible. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start out with some very watery burnt sienna with my silver black velvet size 8 round which I do 90% of my painting with. I'm painting on an 8 by 10 inch size piece of hot press by Strathmore. Next I'm going to get some very watery Windsor Violet. Remember if you don't have my exact colors just use what you have. Color is much less important than getting the values right. Now I'm going to get some Holbein Oriolan, very watery. I'm painting all this on dry paper. Getting some more burnt sienna and going slowly and looking carefully at my reference photo. Got, got a brush full of watery Holbein Oriole in there. So notice the pattern. I keep changing colors. Painting negatively around that cute little white mustache area. I find I paint in a totally different way than I do on cold press. So I like that about hot press. It makes me looser and it gives my work a completely different style. And here I'm just working with some very watery Windsor Violet. One of the benefits of working so watery is nothing dries too quickly so I can connect this burnt sienna for example to that purple on his forehead and I won't get a weird line which is hot press is very bad about that. So when I do paint with hot press in a loose style I use a lot of water. If you find you have too much water in your brush, you can just blot it off on your tissue. So always have a tissue or a sponge at hand. Notice a general rule where there's shadows and it's bluer or cooler, I use my purple. And where the light is hitting the chipmunk, I use more yellows and burnt siennas. This is very watery Windsor Violet here on dry paper. There's some milk consistency, burnt sienna there. And then really thick cream consistency, lamp black. I didn't want it to bloom quite so much, so I blotted up some of that bloom to keep the black racing stripe a stripe instead of a blob. A 
that's just kind of some junk on my palette. A little bit of everything, burnt sienna and lamp black. Milk consistency burnt sienna there. Keep the brush moving so it stays in a stripe. If I dab at it too much, it'll bloom out. Now I'm gonna get some watery cobalt to put on the shadows underneath the animal, like on his lower chin and chest. Very watery cobalt blue there. Very watery Holbein Oriolan. Now I'm gonna pick up some much thicker, almost cream consistency. I would say between milk and cream consistency, burnt sienna. And then I'm using a little bit of naphthol red mixed with a blue to create that nose color. Getting some milk to tea consistency, cobalt blue to do the underpainting of the eye. I'm gonna get some really thick cream consistency lamp black and see how I'm trying to attach the eye to the rest of the animal. I'm not just painting the eye, I'm letting it bleed into his face a little bit there and that will help attach that eye to the animal and not make the eye look like a cutout. All right, now I'm gonna get ready to paint my background with these Rockwell paints. If you don't have Rockwell paint, just use colors that you have. First, I get the whole background wet with clear water and it's like applying paint and you paint negatively around the furs that you wanna keep light. And I highlighted some white fur on the chipmunks left our right side so I painted around those areas and kept that paper dry where I want that white fur to jut out into the background. There I'm getting some green. You could use permanent green light really scrubbing because because I have so much water in my background I need more paint in my brush to get it the darkness I want and I'm painting negatively around those white furs now you can see where I left the dry paper on the back of his neck
I wipe the sides so that I don't have puddling water anywhere. Now I'm putting a glaze of blue over his backside, which will help attach him into the painting, push his haunches back in space to make him look more three-dimensional and make his head look like it's coming forward and direct the viewer's eye to look at his head and not his haunches. And then when the painting dries, you can just continue to build up fur textures as much as you want. And the bottom layers will shine through. And here's the fun part, these new stencils. I got these on Amazon. A lot of them are available on Etsy as well. And there's Etsy sellers who make their own little stencils. So there's a zillion stencils out there that are available these days. So here's my little stencil brush, which by the way, is great for making all kinds of textures in watercolor painting, not just for use with stencils. I love this brush for fur textures. So I'm gonna get pretty thick paint with just enough water added to activate it because if it's too drippy, it'll seep under parts of the stencil where you don't want paint to go. So you do have to use pretty dry paint. Is it working? Kind of. I'm using Rockwell paint for all this background color, but you could use a mix of ultramarine blue and Holbein Oriolan to make a green or any other forest green would be pretty. Mixing up some Windsor Violet now. Dotting off the extra water off my brush. Looks pretty good. Nice and abstract, kind of cool. nothing looks too literal, really cool. and that's how a background should be. Remember too that you can move these stencils around so that the flowers are pointing at your subject. You don't have to use it straight up and down like you can see I have my stencil upside down now because I want those flowers to kind of point their stems mm -hmm. towards the squirrel to help direct the viewer's eye back at the chipmunk, not the squirrel. <laughs> Getting more thick cream consistency paint over there. Windsor Violet. I'll let some of it overlap onto his here, why not? Ooh, that's gonna be too watery. Right. Got messed up. If you get a wet mark that you don't like, you can just blot it away like I did right there. And you can't have it too watery, that's for sure. I decided to go in freehand and darken some of these flowers to make them pop a little bit more. And I didn't do this, but now that I look at it, I think another pretty thing would be to take a rigger, which is a brush with the really long bristles that make really pretty stems and put a few stems in too. By the way, you may have guessed the reason why I'm choosing a lot of purple is purple is the complementary color of the yellows and browns and oranges that are in the chipmunk. So these colors are across each other from the color wheel. They're complementary. They're opposite colors, basically. So they vibrate with each other. So these colors help play off each other to really make that chipmunk glow. All right, now I'm gonna try another approach. This is the first time I'm trying this, is using this magic eraser with the stencil. Again, this will work best if you work with non-staining paint colors. So don't use phthalo blue, alizarin crimson, and other staining colors if you plan on using a magic eraser with them. So what I do is tear off a little piece like this, and then I'll get it wet in clean water. And again, I'll choose the orientation of the flowers so that they're 
The flowers and their stems are pointing at the chipmunk. Now here, I didn't know how it would look to erase some in front of the chipmunk, and I think that looks great. Look how beautifully that erased. Then you can blot again too after you lift the stencil up as well. So you get your, your stencil wet and then you squeeze out the excess water so it's just kind of a damp magic eraser you're using. If it's too drippy, it'll make a mess. Once I got to this stage of the painting, I feel like this is what we artists call the ugly stage. And it's where a lot of beginners panic, but it's so important not to panic and just continue working on your painting. Listen to what it tells you it needs. To me, the chipmunk was getting lost in the background. So I decided after everything was perfectly dry to go in with a glaze of cobalt blue and put it over the entire background to push the background back in space. Watch what happens when I apply this background and watch how Magically, the chipmunk seems to jump forward in space in the painting. I put another glaze on half of the light part of the eye, not the full, because I want a little bit of a granny in there. I'm using my stiff scrubber to try to lighten that top, top edge so that there's a gradient in the eye and makes it really glisten and look very real. So you see, this is how you work on a painting. You, it's like a give and take. You put on, you take off. You see how it looks, you fix. It's not a straightforward linear process. It's kind of like a push and pull. That's a great way to approach the process of painting, especially if you're not working on commission look at it as play, just trying new things. If it doesn't work out, you can either fix it or do another painting. So don't let it be a stressful process. Let it be fun where you're curious and you're letting your childlike playful curiosity come out and try new things and not be afraid of ruining your painting because it's just a painting and it'll teach you so much actually when you do make mistakes. One little secret of how to really give your painting a wow factor is what I'm doing now, which is jewelry, adding tiny little like millimeter details to the eyes, little tiny eyeliner, and really making it extra special to make this little chipmunk really pop off the page like he's actually alive. Another thing that I learned recently from John Lovett by studying his paintings is these little scribbles he does. I love them. So I've been scribbling more and more in my paintings. Here I'm putting scribbles of black paint. All right, on perfectly dry paper, I activate my gel pen by touching it to my skin and then scribbling away. I'm getting some pure tea consistency, naphthol red. Pops of red very, very often will really bring your painting alive. So I'm putting little tiny pops of tea consistency red on the nose, ears, and forehead, and a little bit in the grasses to really make this painting have a little extra pop. 
One thing I would suggest when you're taking tape off a hot press paper, it tears really easily, very unlike Arsh cold press, which I usually use. So I use my hair dryer to get the tape really hot to help it come off the paper more cleanly and not tear the, tear the paper. And I still had a little bit of tear. And I'm gonna sign with my white gel pen. And voila, thank you so much for joining me on this tutorial. I hope you'll subscribe and join me for the next playful journey in watercolor. Thank you so much to my Patreons for making this channel possible. And I will see you all next time. And now go watercolor your world. Bye everybody.